Good afternoon. This is PACEF's last lunch and lecture of this academic year, and we're very pleased to have uh, Rudy Altamirano here to talk to us. Uh, he is Director of International Student and Scholar Services at Penn. He provides leadership in determining and implementing strategies for ISSS, including the delivery of services and programs for international students, for scholars, faculty, staff, and exchange visitors who come to Penn. Rudy has held regional and national leadership positions in NAFSA, the Association for the for International Educators. He has presented many workshops dealing with immigration, with cross-cultural communication, and conflict resolution. He has a doctorate in international resource development with a concentration in cross-cultural communication. And I just want to add that Amy Gadsden is unable to be here at this time. Uh, we doubt that she will be able to come for this talk. Uh, Amy is deliberating with a jury right now. This is a trial that has gone on for a while and has lasted longer than she had anticipated. So Rudy will be giving us the presentation. Please welcome him. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for inviting us. Amy is very excited to be here. Unfortunately, she called me last night at uh, 7 p.m. and I said, well, this might not happen. So I'm here alone, but I will focus more on the what we call the changing immigration landscape that has impacted our university. I think the most appropriate title is not the changing immigration landscape, but more the unpredictable immigration landscape. Uh, we have been... Uh, it's like a seesaw, it's like a roller coaster dealing with this uh, landscape. You know, the university was, was in a shock for the last three months and we're just doing our best to make sure that the university is responding appropriately to the to this executive orders. What I'll do is I'll go to the what happened, the timeline, and what happened since then, and what Penn has done to respond to this uh, executive orders and travel ban and we'll leave it up to the questions after that so the first I'm sure a lot of you have seen this and you have been following the news but the first executive order related to the travel ban happened on Friday January 27 I remember this happening I've been we've been waiting we're anticipating and so when I left the office at 630 uh, there's not a lot of news yet but at 7 o'clock in the morning I was called by a lot of colleagues in the university asking me questions already because the executive order has been imposed. And of course, when, you, when you're dealing with this, you don't have the answers immediately because it's very, very ripe, still new. You don't know. It's like a moving target. However, you know, we are a reputable university. We bring the best of the best from all over the world. And so we have to respond appropriately and successfully. So, the, as you know, the first executive order signed by Donald Trump enforced a travel ban for seven countries. Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. However, what is not mentioned, what is not very clear, but is embedded in the ban, is a lot of restrictions. Uh, one of them is the suspension of the visa interview program meaning that people who are applying for visas can no longer doing that remotely. They have to interview personally, face-to-face, -face in the embassies abroad. And with that, it's not only impacted the seven countries, but it also has impacted our current faculty, foreign national faculty, our students, our scholars, who are trying to renew their visas. And if you remember, this became a very big, it was very chaotic, because even those who are green card holders were impacted and some of them were not able to enter the United States. And I'm sure you have seen that in the news. And so it has created a lot of ripple effect throughout the nation. On February 3, days after, it's a Friday, 
the U.S. District Court in the Western District of Washington issued a temporary restraining order suspend the enforcement of the executive order nationwide. So Penn, including my office, was very relieved uh, because a lot of our faculty, a lot of the, our departments, a lot of our international students and scholars are panicking because of this. Um, so I thought that was done. However, on March 6, one month later, President Trump revoked the January 27, 2007 executive order, uh, 13769, and imposed another travel ban, a replacement order. He said, I'm not happy with this. Let me do a replacement order, which reinstated a travel ban for nationals from six countries, which is Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. You notice that one country is missing, and that's Iraq. Iraq was removed from this reinstatement. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know what happened. Uh, it was a decision made by the Trump administration. Days later, the federal judges in Hawaii and Maryland ruled against executive order. Of course, Judge Derrick from the U.S. District Court issued a worldwide receding order blocking the two core provisions, which is the 90-day halt in the issuance of visas to those six countries and 120-day halt on the refugee admissions from all countries. While in Maryland, uh, Judge Theodore Chuang issued a nationwide preliminary injunction prohibiting enforcement of the 90-day ban against those six countries and then denied the plaintiff's request to block other parts of the March 6 executive order, including a temporary ban on refugees. So this was, until now, there's a restraining order. Aside from the ban, and this is very confusing, aside from the executive orders, there is a mandate from the government, and that is the suspension of the premium processing for H-1B. How many of you are familiar with what H-1B means? Some of you are very familiar, and for some of you who are not familiar, these are the visas for our temporary workers or temporary employees. These are, this can be faculty working in the university or researchers, and we rely on them uh, a lot. And so when this, on Friday, March 6, they announced the suspension, which will be effective April 3, ISS, my office, has already about 84 or 86 cases from the pen departments. And pen departments are relying on us because they paid money to the federal government so that this premium processing will happen. And so I said, what do we do? We have less than a month to deliver this 80, 80 plus H-1B cases. Typically for our office, one case will take about three months. For our office, one case takes a lot of time, a lot of concentration, a lot of detail-oriented work. But imagine working and delivering. We don't want to fail the university. We want to bring this faculty to the university. We want to bring this research. We want this to continue upholding our research and teaching uh, status of the university. And so I have to work with my team and say we have to work not double time, but triple time. Uh, we made our every effort to submit premium processing applications already in, in our possession before the April 3, 3 deadline. That's giving us less than a month. So I, I have to work on making sure that they have overtime. We have to pay for overtime, calm time on Saturdays and Sundays to be able to deliver on this. Or else the university will not be uh, able to bring this faculty and researchers. So... We made every effort to do that, and uh, we reached out. Our advisors reached out to the pen departments and administrators with pending application on an individual basis, informing them, giving them about you know the real reality checks, making sure that if they have not provided us with pertinent information to process their cases, that they have to do so immediately before the April 3 deadline. So you can just imagine departments and faculty dealing with this. What? What's happening here? But at the same time, they understand, they fully understood that we have to be together in this. My office needs the partnership and their support to be able to meet the April 3 deadline. And we were able to, by that time, we also accepted 
last minute submissions because everyone panicked already that, oh, I, 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 can I still make this? So they submitted, some departments of Penn submitted H-1B applications within the time frame. And so before April 3, we were able to successfully submit about almost 90 plus H-1Bs. And that is very, uh, I have to be nice to my staff and give them a tender loving care and a pat on the back and make sure that they get a calm time one day with what I call the Rudy time that they can use before the summer is over. I think we have to applaud the work of ISS. We have, a, we're only, we have seven advisors doing this for almost 5,000, you know, 5,000, 7,000 students and scholars in the university. And so that is, I, I really am very proud with the work that our office have done and the support that we got from Penn Global. So how did ISS and Penn Global, if Amy is here, he will, she will be talking on the first one, but how did we respond to this? So Penn Global, I'm part of Penn Global, so I, I'm also part of this, but I have to separate the, the, you know, the, the, the tasks that we have done. Uh, Penn Global has provided communication to Penn community with university leadership, working with President Gottman and Provost Price and Executive Vice President Craig Carnaroli and Zeke Emanuel, making sure that we are sending a positive message to our international students and scholars affected by the executive order. Uh, we develop a centralized website for immigration policy updates. We have to make sure that we are updated on this so that the university do not feel that we are lagging behind. We want to make sure that the university is well aware. We form working groups to respond to travel bans Working groups you know, consist of different Penn stakeholders because there's a lot of question about admissions. How do we deal with admissions? What do we tell people who admitted from those affected countries? And even those not affected by this. We have questions from our students and scholars. Students, for example, I don't want to go home. What do I do next? Where do I live during the summer? Do I have options for employment? Do I have options for housing? What support can the university provide to us? And so these working groups are working in tandem, making sure that we are responding appropriately. And then we met with stakeholders in campus like you folks, uh, and making sure that departments and stakeholders are well apprised of what's happening. We, uh, Penn Global coordinated with Penn Law to hold immigration information and travel referral clinics. I think they did three clinics and our global support services provide guidance on international travel to Penn community because, for example, Penn Wharton, for example, Wharton will be uh, leading a lot of groups to, to many parts of the world. And what do we do with those? Some of them are hesitating. How can we advise them? Uh, so it's not just the people coming in, but those who are going out of the country. What is our, our response as ISS? We invited, I invite, immediately I invited immigration law firms, the top two law firms in the Philadelphia area, to hold legal clinics on campus. It's pro bono for our students and scholars. It was well received. Um, but at the same time, Penn uh, shouldered the cost for this. I think it's a very good service to our very, very troubled, very confused, very frustrated, angry uh, international students and scholars. We conducted a lot of town hall meetings across campus, medicine, Wharton, uh, engineering, graduate school of education, SP2, uh, Annenberg, so uh, GSE, for example. So many, 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 and also with students and also scholars. We reached out to the Muslim student and scholar community one Friday to make sure that we are supportive of them and we provide support and advising during the time. We provide pop-up advising. Instead of advising in our office, we went across campus to so making sure that we are reaching out to people beyond our office. We did a rapid response programming uh, to hear, to listen uh, to the frustrations and the anger and the fear of our international students and scholars. We partnered with the Perry World House staff to run this. You know, we, we announced this at 10.30 in the morning for 12 o'clock rapid response, and about 40 people showed up 
And that's very rare for us to be able to do in one hour and a half. And people showed up to, because they want to be listened to. They want to be part of the dialogue. They want to be heard. Uh, we partner with pen units to respond to individual cases. Again, going back to individual uh, assistance. I need housing. I need support. My mom is sick. How can I go home? Uh, I'm getting married. Should I go home? I'm from Iran. Uh, very, very scared. Very, uh, this is the insecurity of our students and scholars are really, really very evident. And then we provided up-to-date communication regarding changes to immigration policy. We do this thinking and balancing that we are not here to scare people off or alarm unnecessarily, but provide immigration updates so that our university community is well informed. And so I want to uh, end with this, that uh, our stand, as Penn Global, ISS, and Penn, are we are committed. We must not and will not remain silent. We support President Gottman's statement that we stand for open-hearted compassion and open-minded opportunity. We will remain unyielding in our allegiance to our fundamental principles and to each other, and Penn will not bend. And we will remain with this stand. We will commit. We were committed, and we are very supportive. Right now, we are developing a video that will be used for the whole university, uh, Red and Blue, the Red and Blue song that will be sang in different languages so that we show that we are a very diverse campus and we welcome anyone from all parts of the world, from all nationality groups, from all religions, from all perspectives to the university because we are committed to the, a diverse campus. So that's my talk. Uh, you know, if you have question and answer, and I can share, if Amy doesn't show up, I can share the demographics that we have right now so that you will be familiar with the landscape, how the demographics have changed from the last 10 years in terms of the Penn Global or Penn, our international population. Do you have any questions or do you want me to show you the demographic? How many students are there from the six countries? Well, for the six white countries, we have about less than 100. Less than 100. But if you do the scholars, then we have one. Yeah. Yes. And it, it comes and goes because our scholars come and go. Some will be staying here for six months. Some will be here for five years. So almost in the 300. But again, it's a moving number. What advice do you give a student when you have What advice we have to give them is, even though there's a temporary training order, we have, I have been very conservative, meaning do not travel unless necessary. Do not travel. Because uh, we don't know. There's a restraining order right now. But if you travel and stay, for example, in Yemen for two weeks, things can happen. Maybe this temporary restraining order will be lifted, and then you're stuck in Yemen. So for us, unless, unless, unless necessary, do not travel. How does this affect your admissions? Very good question. We've been meeting with the, with the admission units. Right now, it's very premature to tell. So far, uh, this is not official, but not a lot of changes. Because a lot of them apply prior to the executive order. And so we will, I think the impact, my thinking, and I can, I can be wrong on this, we may know the impact more next year than this year. Is that for both graduate and undergraduate? Yes, it yeah, can happen. But we don't know yet. It's really premature. And hopefully not. Because we are a very global university. And my hope is that our students, when I talk to, anecdotally, when I talk to individual people, they, they will tell me that my parents is rethinking, why are we thinking whether to send my brother or sister to Japan or to the United States? Uh, they're rethinking whether to send them to Australia or France or Germany or England or New Zealand or even Japan or Korea or China uh, instead of the United States, even Japan, of course, because they don't know. It's very fluid. The situation is very fluid. And for those who are here or also, they're very scared because there's an anti-foreign sentiment in terms, can I get a job? Can I get a job? Again, this is not 
back to our meeting. I did not do a survey or a study on this, but I talked to those students. And some of them, when they said that they're interviewing for jobs, the employers will say, you know what, we're not interested now in hiring international students. Sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were international. So let's not proceed with this interview. So I have an advice who comes from Pakistan. Which isn't on the list right now, but it's a Muslim country. Yeah, what sort of advising do you give? Exercise caution. Still, again, because we don't know which countries will be added if there's another executive order. I, 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 I can foresee him that he might not settle down with all this temporary trade order. And I don't know to what extent he will expand this travel ban. So even from Pakistan, I would say, if I were you, I would, miss, I would not travel. And sometimes they don't want to hear that, but I said, because you're asking me, I was a former international student myself, I'm a dad of a pet, pet student, I would not. Even in Pakistan. Yes. Good? Yeah. Well, um, has the admissions uh, staff made any comments about changing rates of acceptance? Because it seems to me that while you could argue that uh, the admissions or that the, uh, uh, the admissions process might not have changed or that the number of uh, applications might not have changed, but what if that acceptance? Because I think that, you, that there should be data on that. Yes, I have talked to Liz O'Connell from an admission, and she has not commented with that uh, because that's a very good question. I think that's one thing that in the, in the admission working groups that we're having, it's more, they're very concerned about the yield. Like how do we do? What do we tell people? What do we tell prospective students? It's more of what do we communicate? So my office, what our office did is we developed a, a template of oh, a letter of welcome, making sure that they feel they still feel welcome, that they will plan ahead in applying for visas. Because they're not they're supposed to still get visas, but plan ahead. Because remember, they halted, they suspended the visa interview waiver program. But no, they have not talked about this. Is there a change of strategy related to that? But I mean, that's a very, very good question. Can I ask <clears throat> systematic study of, I mean, higher education is one of the few products that this country still successfully exports. Uh, has there been any systematic study of, the, of just how serious the economic impact for the country as a whole would be if these policies were to be determined? Based on this, I'm part of the NASA, so you put international educators. We have done a lot of economic impact statements that, that will show the, the, the positive impact of bringing our internationals to the universities and to the state of Pennsylvania. So every state has their own economic impact statement. And we have done that, but I think, I, I'm glad you're bringing this up, we have to bring this back to our universities and make an aim and I, set, in fact, send it to our colleagues here in terms of here's the impact of bringing international students and scholars to the university and to the state of Pennsylvania. And you can see the, mil the dollars that they're bringing, but also not just that, but the rich, you know, the, the diversity and the rich academic richness that they bring to the, to the landscape here. But you're not systematic, we have done that, but more so I think what we need is communicating to our, to our constituents and our colleagues here, so that they don't know more about, wow, this is big numbers. So communicating to the decision makers. The decision -makers. Responsible yeah. for the we have provided the two when we, <coughs> when we visited uh, the senators and the Congress folks. And they look at this, wow, this is huge. Thank you for giving this to us. Wendy said to bring you and Amy. Yeah, but I think, I, think, I think she wants us to give the, pers the landscape here yeah, and then for the litigation piece. I don't want to speak on her behalf, but I'm sure she has some updates that we, you know, we're not yet ready to, or maybe she will be ready to share. Is there any interaction between Penn and adjacent academic institutions in Philadelphia? Yes, we have been talking, not just with those adjacent institutions, but we've been talking with the Ivy League class and looking at the more strategic. We're all in the same boat, and we're all in the same anger and same frustration. And so we're trying to see what's the best avenue to advocate for this, whether working with groups like this, whether our, our, our lobbyists, all our government representatives, 
Our people, our colleagues in the government affairs, working with the colleagues in my level, working with my counterparts. So we're very active in that nationally and also across the state. And we're, we're just trying to, right now, it's just keeping up our, you know, keeping our heads high and trying to do all the demands that something, like, he will throw that, let me say, the H1B premium pricing, he threw the wrench and said, oh, you know, we're just dealing with executive orders and in the middle of this, this came. And so we're just trying to make sure that we're providing a very streamlined, very effective service to the university. Uh, and making sure that we're providing the best support, the best advice, the best legal advice, but also the, making sure that those H-1Bs and green card <coughs> applications are submitted on time and get it on time, but also our, our international students <coughs> and scholars are able to, to be provided with the appropriate documents to come here. So it's just trying to find that balance. But you're right, we have to, and we continue <coughs> to partner with our colleagues. Uh, there's an international conference in May in Los Angeles, and this is, I'm sure, one of the big, big discussions and more of partnering and collaborating and strengthening the strategic initiatives for making sure that we're responding appropriately. Mm -hmm. Kind of a corollary to that, have you encountered either in peer institutions or other um, institutions of higher learning a uh, somewhat different philosophy, a little more cautious philosophy about um, the process of educating a lot of individuals from um, other countries that might not be quite as sanguine as, as Penn's? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. I mean, one could make the worst case scenario yeah. about educating people in uh, advanced biology who then become interested in, in biological weapons or in advanced physics who get interested in the weaponizing of various uh, issues. And um, there are more conservative individuals, probably institutions, who would say this is something we need to be cautious about. Not necessarily in these six countries, but just in general, that we are exporting a lot of information and we're teaching a lot of people a lot of things. And um, our philosophy here has been, this is always a positive thing, that the intercultural relationships we have are <coughs> positive. But I can't imagine there are people who don't feel quite that strongly about that. Yeah, uh, I, I, I wonder if you had any interaction with that. I, I, you sense. know, my, my last meeting with the I we are almost in the same category. We're trying to, how did you do this? Did you communicate already? How did you communicate? Almost, to be honest, we're almost in the same page about this. Uh, I think our goal, and in fact, we went beyond that. It's like we compared notes with Northwestern and Chicago and Berkeley, for example. Almost at the same pace. You know what? We, 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 one thing we want to make sure is we communicate timely and appropriately and correctly. So nobody said, let's back off on this and see what happens. Not yet. Okay. I, have, I have not talked to people. We're always in the same place. Like we're working together, okay. and no one wants to stay behind. Uh, that's what I know. But no one is so far that's alarming the university because we don't want to alarm people to and overreact. Uh, we just want to be cautious and how can, how can, we, how can we be proactive? Is, is the university ready uh, to respond? MIT and Harvard were visited by the Department of State um, just recently regarding the genuine scholars that they're hosting. So if both universities were, were you know, they three day visit for both universities. So if they were visited, we have to be ready to be visited. And so we are always making sure that if they come, we are ready. Uh, like the STEM OPT, their like, site visits were already done in Yale from, from Yale students were visited. And the employees of those students were visited in Washington, D.C. So yesterday, um, on Monday, I convened a working group involving our Penn colleagues to make sure that we are ready in case there's a site visit from the federal government. How do we respond to the university? Because we are bringing those OPT students, STEM OPT, to our campus. Not just from Penn, but from Harvard, from Yale, from MIT. And we want to make sure that we are on top of things. Any other questions? You said originally that there was a, um, many of the parents were concerned about sending their kids, not just to Penn, but to the United States. So my question is, are there any good survey data measuring the impact of the decrease that's bound to be coming across the entire country from, from students who would have come here but now are going to go to Not yet. We have not, I have not seen any. I was just reading uh, 
a Chicago Tribune article three days ago, and it's more people talking about this, and they include University of Chicago, my counterpart in Northwestern, but they have not. It's more anecdotal. Mm -hmm. But you're right, it, it has not been done. I have not seen any. I'm sure it seems to me a major, be a major piece of the, of the purpose for, for easing these rules if there was if there was a greater understanding of the overall national impact. Yes, and that's a very good, I'm sure. My, 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 what I heard is my association is looking at this in many different angles, but that's a very good idea looking at the landscape, national landscape. Uh, that would be the wisest thing to do. How are you risking that? Those data should be easy to obtain even now, but look at the number of accepted yeah. students right, versus right. those who declined yeah. versus the historical data from the last five years. And I mean, and you can do that throughout the Ivy Leagues, probably one day you get that data. Uh, because our admissions group knows exactly yeah. who was accepted this year. What the numbers of applicants are this year. Yeah, well, the, both those, both of those metrics. Just become available. Yeah. But now it's the first time. Right. You have only one year to get yeah. No, no, but you would know, for example, last year we, 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 we accepted X number of foreign students and, and Y accepted us. And this year we accepted. X and half of Y accepted yeah. us, or half of Y came. Yeah. So you only have one year of comparison, is what no, I'm no. saying. And, and yeah. the, the data for this year is just in the middle of the uncertainty and turbulence. Right. Uh, so, I mean, it, it can point, but it's not conclusive at all. Yeah. But it's relevant. I'm, I'm, Very relevant. And it's relevant. That's the next steps. The next, I'm sure ad admission offices all over the sure. right. country will be excited. You'll be curious. Mm -hmm. Is this impacting? Is it only Penn? How about Yale? How about Harvard or Princeton? And we probably also know where they went. Yes. Um, because most of the time people track yeah. people turning down, at least in the medical school we and uh, or you know, residencies and internships. We know if they didn't accept us, they went to Hopkins or to Harvard or to some UCSF. Yeah, we, I, I would be curious to see that too. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. <coughs> Slightly different question is how do we deal with undocumented students mm -hmm. and ice and yeah, my office are not, ISS specifically, have not worked directly with them uh, because we're within our purview, but the university has taken a more open stand when it comes to undocumented. They're welcome to enroll here. We are, welcome, we are providing support and service to our undocumented students. So that doesn't affect scholarship. They have been, but another, <coughs> number, another part of the campus is still with them. Is it known how large the undocumented population is? I'm not sure about that. I don't know about the numbers, sir, to be honest. But there's a danger if you made a list of those. Yeah, that yeah that's why they're very easy. Well, the other, yeah. Going back to your initial point, it seems to me that part of the major problem here is that we cannot understand the logic choice of the countries in question in the first place, specifically the conspicuous absence of Saudi Arabia from the list. But I've also been a victim of this in that I'm on the board of trustees of the University of Qatar, so I have been subject to this absurd regulation regarding battery-powered instruments. I had to take six books with me for the 16-hour flight to, to Doha, because <laughs> we're not back, you have to put it now in your check baggage. Now, why? Why are Morocco and Turkey on that list? What suddenly has happened to Morocco and Turkey regarding uh, electronic equipment? And they're on that list, but they're not on any other yeah, list. Um, yeah, and I'm scratching my head. None of it As makes sense. Yeah, I, 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 heard, I, heard I, yeah. I heard yesterday on the radio that the government is considering expanding that to many other countries. Basically, all of overseas travel. Yeah. All of overseas travel, yeah. that's yeah. right. Yeah. Really? Yes. yes. Yeah, so the question is why? Well, that, I mean, that, because no, that's the big question. Was, why? There was a terror. Their justification is that there was a terrorism incident mm -hmm. within the last year that involved uh, a computer. Uh, yeah. That, that's their reason. Well, but the, the idea that you put it in the check baggage is going to be better. Well, they're worried about. I mean, they're worried about the batteries exploding. There are too many of them. Well, you know, the battery explodes in the check bag. It's not much better. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they have more sophisticated. I mean, my point is, that I don't understand the logic of, of this. Yes. You know, and I, I'm supposed to be a Middle East expert, right? <laughs> but no, don't ask me, please. I'm wondering if Kindle is included in that. Yeah, I couldn't take my Kindle. Take a Kindle either. No, I took my camera out too. 
I took everything out. I was going to bring up a, sort of a secondary issue, which you, your office probably didn't deal with, but a lot of the students on campus have been harassed since the Trump election, mm -hmm. and probably more so since these um, issues have come up. Just walking across campus, um, and I don't think they're harassed by other Penn students so much as potentially outsiders. I don't know for sure, but the ones that were in my class who were told to go back home, to, you know, what are you doing here, um, just because they had slightly different appearances. They, and many of them were not from any of these countries, but there's this, there's this sense on campus that things are a little bit disquieting, and that, that was very upsetting. It was particularly upsetting early last semester with the, um, the threats to some of our oh, black students. Yeah, and, the um, and then, yeah, the Facebook, and then after Trump's election, the next day our class was like, you know, it was a, a therapy session just to mm -hmm. interact with the students. People are very, very angry and scared and very fearful. Yeah. Um, do you have any cooperation with the technology companies, for example, in the area? I know I got stuck in a protest of Comcast employees right mm -hmm. after this mm -hmm. came down. Not, not much, to be honest. We have not. You know, we have separate the industry and us. We have been focusing on the higher education support network. huge implications and it's a, as I've said it's unpredictable. You don't know how how or what or when it will happen. And we just have to be not fully ready but at least prepared and continue to be resilient as a university. Well the some of this policy being driven by uh, the STEM policy of the federal government yeah, a lot of them are, our engineering students are very big on the STEM, they're looking for forward to working. In the kind of, and now a lot of our engineering students are talking to me as a little, you know, I can find a job, you know? And they're very scared that the impact of the STEM will be will be changed the way they look at it. So our students are, especially those who are grading this year, are a little bit worried about their future in America. And of course next the, the year, next years, the following years, there are more uh, about what will happen. Last year, we were the most fortunate because they were able to get in. But again, the issue is extending their STEM OPT is the biggest, uh, the biggest concern. Will they be able to extend? Uh, because right now, they were able to work 24 months more beyond the 12 months. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for inviting us.